Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. The topic of today's online event is food cost dynamics, insights into red meats, grains, and oil seeds. My name is Brandy Yanchik, and I'm an independent journalist and documentary filmmaker who is based in Edmonton, Alberta, which is in Treaty 6 territory. I'd like to acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footprints have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Neheyao, Cree, Diné, Anishinaabe, Sotu, Nakota Ishka, Nakota Sioux, and Nisitapi, Blackfoot peoples. I also acknowledge this as the Métis homeland and the home of one of the largest communities of Inuit south of the 60th parallel. Before I introduce today's panelists, a couple of quick housekeeping items. If you're having difficulties hearing the webinar at any time today, or you are experiencing an unreliable internet signal, you can always use the call-in number included in your webinar registration email, or by clicking the arrow next to the microphone icon and pressing switch to phone audio. There is a box labeled Q&A, this is where you can pose your questions to the panelists. If you see a question in the Q&A box that you think is important to ask, you can also click the thumbs up icon on the question to move it to the front of the queue. We will also have a couple of poll questions for you. Today's event will consist of the presentations by our panelists, followed by some questions after each presentation. We will then have a panel discussion around the topic. Please be aware that this event is being recorded. The recording will be uploaded to YouTube and you will receive the link in an email along with a post-event survey. We will be taking clips from the video and posting these on social media. We do hope that today's event promotes more discussion with a broad diversity of participants. Today I am joined by two distinguished speakers for this discussion. Mark Uhas, the principal and founder of Harvest Insights, a consultancy firm located in Toronto that serves the agri-food industry, and Darla Stepanek, the Associate Dean and Instructor at Lakeland College School of Agriculture Science. Welcome. Before we begin, we have a poll question for the audience. In North America, which red meats are the most consumed? Please rank them in order of consumption. Poultry pork beef, or beef poultry pork, or poultry beef pork. You have 30 seconds to answer the poll, after which we will display the results. Ooh, I'm curious about this one. Okay, in North America, which red meats are the most consumed? 16% of participants said that in North America, people consume poultry the most, followed by pork and beef. 40% of participants think that we consume beef the most, followed by poultry and pork. And 44% of participants believe that we choose poultry the most, followed by beef and pork. The answer to the Zoom poll... Well, according to numbers published by the United Nations Federation of Agricultural Organization, the answer is option number three. In North America, we are consuming 46% poultry, 30% beef, and 24% pork. I will now invite Mark Uhas to start the discussion. As you listen to Mark's presentation, can you please think of some questions that you'd like to ask him and put them in the Q&A box? In your question, we'd love to know your name and a bit about yourself, such as your location and your profession. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the introduction, Brandy, and thank you as well to Tara and Julius and the team at the Simpson Center at the University of Calgary. I'm really happy to be uh, co-presenting at this event and looking forward to our discussions today. So I will continue what uh, has been introduced uh, and to talk about my perspective in red meat. So I will focus primarily on beef, 
pork and to a, a certain degree as well uh, at the end on bison uh, and to, to cover that. So I'll move at a good pace on that. So next slide, please. So to cover this, uh, there's two main parts that I'd like to share. Uh, for today. One is on protein consumption at large, and then of course related to red meat consumption, and also some of these alternative drivers for overall protein consumption, alternative proteins, demand in Canada and internationally for Canadian red meats, and some of these consumer trends driving uh, meat or uh, uh, conventional protein consumption. And then I'll turn to those production costs that we also want to uh, discuss on farm production factors, what's leading to farmers uh, factors in their uh, per, uh, prospects. And particularly I'll focus on Western Canada and Prairies Canada, some of the environmental regulations and policies that can be seen as much as an opportunity and some of the consumer uh, demand factors that also are being realized as a production opportunity. Next slide, please. So one of the things I think that we are all familiar with both, you know, in, in our popular discussion and, and, and of course our realities is been food prices. And from uh, the Statistics Canada uh, uh, Consumer Price Index, actually uh, the price of an aggregate of food purchased in stores and the consumer price index has been uh, decreasing since just, uh, you know, after the, the, the heights of COVID. Whether we actually feel this in reality or the perception of it is something that I hope that we can uh, expand on today. But this graph on the right just shows you the latest um, to March of this year on the overall consumer price points. But maybe again, how we feel in, in store or how our perceptions there are may not exactly line up. But next slide, please. What I would like to illustrate just as a juxtaposition with red meat that I'll focus and go much more deeper on, of course, in the brief time I have, is just the proliferation of alternative protein companies. And I think the reason for illustrating this is just that there is a great deal of, of concern, discussion, whether we talk about health or sustainability or also opportunities in Canada and Western Canada for new new types of plant-based or fermented or, or even cell culture proteins. So there's a great deal of investment in startups in that. And this slide just tries to illustrate that. Next slide, please. In Canada as well, with uh, major organizations like our super cluster Protein Industries Canada, there's been a tremendous amount of investment in alternative proteins, if you will, or plant-based proteins. Some of these are facilities across Canada. Some, and actually some, I should also highlight, have actually gone into receivership. For example, Merit Functional Foods in Winnipeg and Terra uh, that was uh, producing insect protein um, in the top uh, left corner have uh, faced bankruptcy or gone into receivership. There's been a lot of consolidation and some of the objectives of those goals for consumer reception of plant al uh, alternative proteins maybe hasn't uh, quite met its mark. And, I, and, and that's the context I'd like to speak more today about red meat. Next slide, please. So just you know, by way of experience in that and reception to that, um, there is also you know, definitely uh, consideration of plant-based meat. So, you know, the repeat, the amount of repeat uh, use and uh, when, how often people are coming back to it. So if we look specifically at meat, uh, you know, I call him here household penetration and the repeat um, uh, amounts of times, this is statistics that are showing really um, how often people are coming back to these plant-based alternatives and maybe not quite um, uh, getting as much traction. And that's been uh, some of the reason why people are maybe going to more, go, going back to more conventional meats. Next slide, please. This is also to answer the question that was asked at the top, and that is uh, North America. So North American uh, consumption of poultry is very prominent, but there you can see in North America, 30% in the top left corner, and then in third category is pork. But um, what I'll illustrate in the next slide as well is how much in Asia, one of our major markets uh, that pork uh, is a major uh, opportunity of consumption or is uh, consumed significantly. Next slide, please. This is a study that I did with colleagues at Dalhousie University uh, two and a half years ago. But just to sort of illustrate that uh, in Canada, this was a survey of 10,000 Canadians. And in Canada specifically, consumers 
with no dietary preferences, you know, omnivore, carnivore, eating a variety of, of, of course, plants and animals is, uh, uh, you know, more than two thirds of the, the Canadian population. So it, this, I think, again, is a context for red meat consumption. And really, at least from this survey that we conducted, uh, vegetarians and flexitarians are in uh, uh, the minority, but al also this is generationally uh, more evident. So maybe I could discuss that if any questions come up. Next slide, please. This also just to illustrate uh, meat, meat consumer trends uh, in Canada. So um, this, you know, is I think just again to illustrate it, it those eating uh, as uh, claiming to eat less meat is, is almost uh, uh, as, as much as those claim to eat more meat uh, in this survey. So this was a question that asked um, between 2020 and 2021, are you eating, what is the amount of meat you're eating? And almost 19% said that they are eating some degree more. So that was just to sort of illustrate that in comparison to alternative proteins. Next slide, please. And here is just as well, some, some re very recent data for us to get a sense of, of production and consumption in Canada and for Canadian beef and pork. So in the hog industry and in in, in specifically in pork, um, there is, you know, a lot of it has been related to international dynamics and some of the uh, viral uh, infections for uh, populations of, 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 of hog production in China. After that has been uh, corrected, there has been less demand and it has had an impact here in Canada as well on hog production. Um, we are also interesting to note that the Canadian beef herd side is, is the lowest it's been in 35 years. Um, there's a variety of, of implications for that in, in consumer uh, demand has remained uh, steady with that. You know, we have some some statistics on that. I think this this uh, slide deck is maybe from an earlier version, but that's OK. We'll adjust to that. Um, domestically, pork sales have remained, remained positive. And I think it's, again, uh, in relation to consumers and consumer uh, prices at checkout. Uh, pork compared to beef is is more favorable, so that keeps uh, pork uh, sales uh, more buoyant. Um, but there is also, you know, some of this processing capacity. Whether we talk about Western versus uh, uh, um, Eastern Canada, uh, so there is there is some of those um, capacity dynamics, and and ultimately to say really that um, the costs of production, which I'll get into in a moment, but th these are some of the the main observations from a recent Farm Credit, Credit Canada uh, study that just was released very recently. Next slide, please. And in this uh, slide, I, I wanted to illustrate uh, a comparison between beef export markets and pork export markets, and really um, to show uh, some of the leading dynamics. Of course, the United States has and continues to be uh, a major uh, market for for our red meats, especially our beef uh, exports, um, up uh, almost uh, 18, yeah, 18 and a half percent um, to the United States, whereas uh, pork um, has been uh, had a bit of a contraction. But if you look at Japan and Mexico, also major trading partners, a major spike in, in beef exports to uh, Mexico. Um, and, and also we have our Asian markets as well that have um, had, uh, you know, th these major um, opportunities for, for um, Canadian red meats. So these are also, again, consumption drivers. Next slide, please. So I'd like to now turn to some of the actual on-farm production factors that are, that are driving here. Next slide, please. So I think as we'll uh, uh, ex expand on and elaborate on as well, I think that from a production point of view, we're seeing both an opportunity and a pressure for great deal of, uh, of innovation, but also some difficult choices for uh, beef and, and pork operations. And as I'll uh, illustrate a little bit more as well is bison as an opportunity. Um, herd health, I think is very important to consider my understanding is currently is south of the border in the United States, there is a, uh, a flu that's affecting some of the beef uh, production herds in the United States. So some of these herd population factors for red meat production, whether we're talking about swine, swine flu or, or beef uh, uh, production, these are all important on-farm considerations and pressures and awarenesses that 
that uh, producers, beef producers and pork producers are, are well aware of. Land prices, of course, as well, and what is being done with um, land for different pr production purposes, whether we talk about for grazing or for feedstock or for uh, grains, of course, for grain production, as I believe Darla will elaborate on, um, and as well for, for various other ecosystem services. Um, weather, of course, continues to um, be a central factor. Uh, drought, uh, heat stress, these are all factors, whether we're talking about crops um, or stress on animals, um, grazing opportunities, the, the possibilities or realities of grazing and what's feasible, um, labor factors as well, whether we're talking about labor on, on farms for, that are grazing operations or for actual um, production processing facilities. These are all you know, health concerns as well, as we probably know from some of the experiences during COVID with some of the um, um, production and slaughter facilities in Western Canada, and as well, feed prices. So these are all, um, from my perspective and my, my background, really feed prices as well will continue to have competing uh, audiences to where those, those uh, commodities go to, whether it's directly to feed or even also pressure uh, and opportunity for alternative proteins. Next slide, please. But maybe we could also see, uh, not maybe, we should definitely see the production opportunities that exist as well uh, for, for, if you will, uh, a new generation of red meat or an, an innovative generation of red meat production, job creation for, for um, let's say, uh, products and high quality products that can be pr uh, provided to consumers across Canada or for export markets. Uh, grazing and pastured products, um, regional markets where um, in Western Canada, where, where let's say uh, restaurants are looking for particular quality cuts of meat that they could provide to their clientele. Uh, I'll illustrate in a moment about ecosystem services and also really, again, marketing to niche. Um, niche. I think that in the next uh, decade to two decades, we'll see uh, a growing opportunity and maybe even pressure from environmental and, and health points of view for red meat production to be that much more nutritious, nutrition and sustainability focused. Next slide, please. So this just to illustrate the willingness to pay for certain premium uh, proteins and protein alternatives. So the, the five boxes that are black and blue that you can see um, are percentage indicators over regular costs. So in the, starting from the left, 51% for cage-free eggs, through to organic eggs, organic milk. And what I wanted to illustrate from a red meat point, point of view, um, in this study by McKinsey in 2021, 226% uh, uh, willingness to pray for grass-fed whole cuts of beef over conventional formats or grass-fed ground beef, 311%. So these, again, as opportunities in back at the production on farm. Next slide, please. And we could see this happening in different ways, again, some of you may remember from a few years ago when the Earl's restaurant chain uh, wanted to uh, uh, source animal welfare sourced meat. And uh, there was a backlash, if you will, for, for actually the desire to support Canadian produced steaks. So Earl's did a turnaround and they did a rebranding for their sourcing of more sustainable and animal welfare quality of meats. And the image on the right is gemstone grass-fed beef that is working, of course, in Alberta for grass-fed, grass-finished pasture beef raised without um, added hormones, antibiotics, and GMOs. So you, this, again, is this market, this, this uh, market opportunity that is being produced, at least, you know, uh, a, a definitely uh, a ready market in North America. Next slide, please. And I think it's also very interesting to note some of the innovations in production uh, on farm. So we have some innovations like this, an example that uh, Tallgrass Ventures, Calgary based has invested in uh, one cup AI, which is a livestock identification that helps the, uh, the ranchers and those in beef production to look at and, and track the health and sort of the, 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 the actual all comprehensive aspects of the, of the animal. So to understand and maximize their health for a whole range of things. And, and, and this is, I think, an example of technologies and tools that are, are supporting production in Canada for red meat production. Next slide, please. 
I wanted to also illustrate that some of the synergies that are happening between ecosystem restoration, sustainability, and red meat production. Alice Canada, Alice standing for Alternate Land Use Services, works extensively across Canada, but also across Western Canada, in particular Saskatchewan and in Alberta, working with landowners and ranchers, uh, beef producers to take sections of production and, and put it into uh, ecosystem restoration for uh, riparian buffers and actually receiving payments on a contract that sometimes is five to 10 years or more uh, payments for per acre for certain initiatives that, that uh, farmers take. Uh, next slide, please. So here, just a brief you know, uh, scope to look at and share and say that there is, of course, great initiative uh, underway by the uh, Canadian Beef Association on, on at one, addressing productivity and also at being able to address um, some of these market demands. We understand how important the Canadian beef industry is to Canada, to the Canadian economy for jobs and for export markets. Next slide, please. And as well to, I think, be aware of some of these, these growing environmental awareness and, and, and uh, biodiversity imp impacts and awareness of that and then taking uh, measures of that. So these are some statistics and information that the Canadian uh, beef industry is, is also aware of and relating to production. Next slide, please. I wanted to just as a quick uh, snippet to show um, the Canadian bison industry. And these are statistics from the Canadian Bison Association looking at, so at both the number of farms, as you can see, uh, largely in Western Canada and Alberta and Saskatchewan in particular, and so the growth of, of, of um, bison numbers and bison uh, farms. So not necessarily a straight up, upward trajectory, but definitely something that is an opportunity um, with uh, the prospects for uh, potentially uh, production in, in Western Canada. Next slide, please. Uh, and so bison really well suited for grazing, for, for, for nutritional density, uh, for, for working, of course, the land. And I know that there's various initiatives as well I, with uh, Lakeland College. Uh, and one, one um, example I'd like to illustrate, next slide, please, is, is a rangeland bison that has partnerships with bison herds across Western Canada, Al uh, Alberta, and Saskatchewan in promoting a, a diversity of different products that people can buy um, from the website. And, and probably they have partnerships across across the cities and towns in, in uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. And just an example really of, of some positive and uh, uh, marketing of, of bison for consumers in the region. So with that, hopefully there's some questions or maybe for the broader uh, questions. So thank you. Mark, thank you so much. Yes, we do have some questions. So um, I was interested to see that AI is uh, infiltrating every sector personally um, within your presentation there. But here is a question. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Well, it's clear there are opportunities for growth in the red meat sector. Can the planet afford an increase in red meat consumption? That is from someone who is attending. Mark? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a it's a question that a lot of people are, are thinking about. I think that each region in the world will have to uh, figure out what works for its own ecosystems and regions sustainably. I know, of course, that we live in, in a world where there's a great deal of international trade, as was evident from some of these slides that was shared. Um, Canada has a lot of uh, significant uh, export markets. I think that some of the uh, international agreements that Canada is a part of, whether we're talking about climate change or biodiversity or, or national and provincial laws inside Canada um, that are environment and sustainability related will have uh, implications for how red meat is produced. So I think it will be have to be produced more sustainably in all steps from the farm uh, or the ranch through to the consumer uh, and, and before them on their plate. So those are definitely important. And I think that the alternative protein movement is definitely uh, putting pressure on and, and opportunity on consumers' choices. But that's, uh, you know, my, my first uh, take on it. 
Thank you, Mark. So we have a question from Peter Bukowski. You talk about upscale products. What are you doing to protect affordability for those of us at the bottom end, lower 50% of the income scale? Yes, it's, the, it's always the question of, of ability to pay and willingness to pay is, is always going to be uh, a, a critical com, com, commentary and question here, you know, especially some of those those uh, consumer price indexes that were, were shown at the beginning of the presentation are showing, you know, macro macro trends, at least from Statistics Canada's point of view on on food prices. But really, you know, there's other many other factors that go into how much we pay at grocery checkout whether it's for red meat or for any other things that we buy for our, our food for ourselves and our families. So those are just hard, hard realities of economic choices that people have to make. Um, you know, plant-based alternatives are now often more expensive on average. It depends. Uh, red meats, let's say pork, you know, and poultry are definitely, you know, are more price competitive than beef, but there will be, um, I think a, a, a growing, um, uh, pressure for producing meat more sustainably. What will that mean then for production costs that are then translated to consumers will often be a more expensive product. So it will definitely mean that there's going to be a, a, an ongoing evolution of, of what is feasibly able to be produced to, to be profitable for, for farmers and ranchers and food processors, and then really what's affordable for consumers. So Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, well, your presentation was very informative and it has people thinking. Uh, before we hear from our next guest speaker, we're going to do another quick poll question and uh, you'll have 30 seconds to answer the poll. Do you think that it would be better to buy agricultural land or rent agriculture, agricultural land today? Number one, buy agricultural land for long-term stability and potential appreciation. Two, rent agricultural land for flexibility and reduce financial commitment. You have 30 seconds. Okay, in response to the question, would it be a better idea to buy or rent agricultural land today? 76% of participants said they think it's a better idea to buy agricultural land. And 24% of participants said they would choose to rent agricultural land. Fascinating. Well, the answer to the Zoom poll actually is there is no correct answer. But we're going to hear about changes in farmland values and interest rates right now. So I'm going to invite Darla to panic to share her presentation. Please remember to type your questions in the Q&A box. When you ask your question, please tell us your name and a bit about yourself, such as your location and your profession. Thank you, Darla. What I'm going to talk to you today uh, about is, um, is about land prices and about some of the values of our commodities as well, and the prices that we're actually having to pay for some of our commodities. So land values today um, have increased exponentially. We're going to talk about what those actual figures are across Canada. And it does range from province to province, but I really chose to try to keep things more on a, um, on a, a Canadian-wide level. Um, when we have a look at this, we're going to have a look at the impact that interest rates have, um, and then the rent versus to buy decision. And then I've chosen to drill down on one commodity that's grown quite commonly out here in the Western provinces, which is canola. Uh, which has some some really interesting components to it. So the question is, um, don't wait to buy land, buy land and wait. That's really what the key is, is that farmers are seeing exponential increases in land prices, which is um, building equity in their farms, but equity doesn't equal cash. And cash is typically one of the biggest challenges that farms are facing. So this is a, is a chart that I that I took off. Um, I found it in uh, online in a Green News article when we had gone to have a look at this. This is the last hundred years of of land value prices. Uh, this is focusing on Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, and it's fascinating to watch and see where things have grown. Um, we saw that spike in the '80s that everybody talks about. Land prices were, were, were growing up exceptionally high at that time, but we also know that interest rates followed right along with that. So if we have a look at um, the land values that we see here, 
over the last years. We can see the last, uh, since 2023, this last year, we had about an 11.5% increase in our land values. Um, in 2014, we had a, a really high increase as well. And you see it's kind of been up and down. And I think what, what is truly shocking when we add all of this together is the fact that cumulatively over the 10 years, land prices have increased on average in Canada by 137%. So how do farms um, afford to buy land? And, and maybe the more difficult question that we face is how do we transition land from one generation to the next in a way that sets the future generations up for success? So I am an accountant by trade. Um, so what I want to do is actually go through and, and do a little bit of work here with you about going through an example. So in 2013, if you would have purchased a piece of land, and this could be anywhere, this would have been very comparable to the land here in Alberta. I'm located in Vermilion, Alberta. Um, so about $2,500 an acre is what you would have been paying. So the purchase price on a quarter section of land would be the $400,000. Any bank that is going to finance you either wants another piece of land um, to use as collateral or they're gonna want a 20% down payment. So you have $80,000 worth of cash that you need to come up with. If we take a loan based on prime plus 1%, you're looking at an annual payment of around $20,000 a year. So your interest in that first year of that 20,000, about $12,000 of it's going to be interest expense. That puts your cost per acre at $80. Over a 25-year span, if you took that loan for 25 years, you would be paying about $192,000 in interest. Um, I'm a teacher, uh, is what I do. So I, I teach a farm financial management course here at the college. So I have a lot of students who are actually planning on returning to the family farm. And we talk a lot about um, what that's going to look like when they take over and what the, the cost of that's going to be. And I think the biggest challenge they're facing is actually the affordability of land. So with that same land, if you fast forward five years, um, in 2013, it was worth 2,500. By 2018, that land value had increased um, by about 57% and uh, was worth $3,923 per acre. We can look here and see that, of course, bumped our purchase price up, bumped our down payment requirement. We now have um, prime has actually increased a little bit. So we're paying a little bit more for our loan. Our annual payment is now $34,000, and my interest in year one is $23,000. My cost per acre has increased to $146 per acre, and the total interest over the term of my loan is $356,000. That increase in five years is actually remarkable, and I have an example coming up later on that will show you the power of building that equity in your land. So if we were to fast forward to um, last year's values, so 2023 values, and these are all taken off of FCC does a fantastic land valuation report, that breaks it down by province. If you wanted to get more details on that, it's available online. It's a really, really great summary report. So if we were to buy that land now, it would be 137% higher than it was in 2013, and you would be paying $5,926 an acre. That puts that land purchase price at just under a million dollars. Your down payment, just under $200,000. And with today's borrowing rate, an interest rate of about 7.97%. That's the deal breaker. This is what has changed with this increase in land price and this increase in interest costs. That escalates your annual payment to $70,000. And your interest in the first year is going to be $60,000 of that payment. Um, interest cost per acre is $378. And we're going to talk a little bit about cost per acre later on. There isn't room for $378 in interest expense per acre for these new producers. Total interest paid over the life of the loan is $1,013,000. So you are paying more in interest than you were for the original purchase value of the land. That's something that, that, becomes a, a little bit, a lot for the students to, to, to swallow and to take in. So here's historical interest rates um, over the last um, several years. So if we have a look here, things stayed pretty flat in the 40s and the 60s. There was, we see this spike in the 1980s that everybody talks about. People talk about 22% interest rates and 24% interest rates. 
and what happened to the world in there was that big economic crisis, a lot of farmland um, people actually had to walk away from because they couldn't make payments on anymore. We then saw the downfall of interest rates. They really flattened out from 2010 to 2020. This is also where we saw that, that significant increase in land values because we had these flat interest rates that allowed for the land value to appreciate and people could pay more. But what we're seeing now is this appreciation in interest rates and we're sitting at that 7.67% that in borrowing rate. So looking at this map, it's interesting to compare. In the 1980s is when we saw that spike in, in land values here. If we go back to our interest in the 1980s is when we saw that spike in interest rates and then that drop in interest rates was complicated. It, it's exactly accommodating to the same line as this drop in, um, in land values. So looking at what's happening here, I'm not sure we're spiking up. Interest rates are coming up. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with land values. If I did, I, I would be a lot richer than I am now. But I think something is going to have to soften either the interest rates or the values of the land in order to farms to continue to be able to farm profitably. So if we played a what if game, so what if that 1980s returns um, interest rates actually returned to us? What would that look like? Well, if I was paying that $948,000 for that land that it's worth today, um, uh, at a 22.5% interest rate, which was what uh, the rates that were applicable in the 1980s, I would have an annual payment of $171,749. An annual payment on one quarter section of land. And of that, 170,000 of it would be interest. My total interest paid over the life of that loan would be $3.5 million. This is not sustainable. This is not, it's not going to allow for, for new farm operations or um, succession planning at the current rates to take place. So if we have a look at how tight the margins are within the, the world of agriculture. So these are our different commodities that we have here. Um, we have uh, not huge margins on any one of these. If we have a look at this, we've got earnings before taxes. We're sitting at like 5%. Um, we're actually losing money on some of our commodities that we're growing. The margins are not huge. And what happens is so much of it's taken by our cost of goods sold. That's our fertilizers, our seeds, our basic input costs to actually um, get, get the seed into the ground for those, those commodities to grow. We have our direct operating expenses. That's our equipment and our machinery and the things that we need to run our operation. We have our overhead costs and our cost of capital. That's our cost of our equipment that we're running, which is also um, appreciating in price. And then down here, we have our interest expense. And if we have a look at that, $60 is, is not, not a lot of money when it when we look at it to, to what the current uh, amount would be eaten up by our, our interest rates on our land. So this is just a really simple example of why you would buy land. And this might make people a believer in, in our initial poll that we had. So if you were to have purchased two quarters of land in 2013, you would have paid that $400,000 per quarter. So that means you would have paid $800,000 for the land. You would have had a $160,000 down payment. That's at 20%. If you took that land loan at 4% for 25 years, and that's what the market rates were in 2013, you would have a $40,000 land payment, $41,000 land payment. Uh, typically, you can only lock your loan in for five years. So you're going to ride out whatever happens with interest rates. So let's say that land loan becomes due five years later in 2018. So a couple of things have happened. You've paid your balance on your land loan. It started off at six forty. dollars You've paid it down to $556,000 in those five years through your, your principal payments. But what's more interesting is that your land value has increased from $400,000 per quarter section to $627,000 per quarter section. So that means the loan that is owed that was originally on both quarter sections of land can be refinanced on just one quarter section because one quarter section is worth $627,000. 
That's the power of equity. And that's the power of land appreciation working in favor of the farmers. Because I now own one quarter section outright, I can use that as security for buying another piece of land and continuing to grow my operation. If I look at my refinancing, interest rates would have gone up um, and I'm going to um, refinance it over another 20 years so that I will finish paying it off in, in the original timeline of 25, I would have interest payments of about $43,000. So this is why you would want to buy farmland is because it, if it continues to appreciate in value, you get the benefit of that appreciation. So the reality is, though, is renting farmland is a really viable option and maybe a necessary option. So uh, my quick question is how, how much cultivated farmland is rented in Canada? So of the cultivated farmland, is it 20%, 40%, 50%, or 60%? Um, and everyone can take their guess. And the reality is I asked my husband and my son this, and I am a grain farmer as well as, a, as a, an instructor and the dean here at the college. So I live this every day. And 40% of the farmland in Canada is actually rented. Um, so that means that people who own the land aren't actively farming it, and they may be in a retirement situation, or they might be just buying the land as an investment. So renting the um, land, how do we decide what's a fair price to rent the land for? So 2.55 um, is the rent to price ratio. So basically you would take the value of your land and times it by 2.55%. And that's typically what you would see the rental rates being on that farmland. So I wanna compare that to our, our costs of purchasing land that we had looked at on those other charts. So if I have a look at, um, again, I took my three years of 2013, 2018 and 2023. I took my escalating values of that land. Um, if we were to purchase it, we would have these down payments that we need to make. So in 2013, I would have an annual payment of $20,000. Um, and my cost per acre for the interest would be $80 an acre. And I'm going to compare that to my average rental cost, which is taking the 2.55% of the $400,000 would be about $64 an acre. So right now, there's a slight advantage to renting, as in it costs me a little bit less per acre, but I'm also not building equity. In 2018, my interest cost goes up to $146, and my average rental cost is about $100. So again, there's still, there's now like a $40 for almost $50 advantage to renting over buying. But again, I'm not building equity. The game changer comes in 2023. When we look at this, my interest cost, because interest rates have increased and my purchase price has increased so exponentially, that my interest cost per acre is 378 and my rental cost per acre is only 151. So if I look at buying a piece of land in 2023, I would need to come up with $189,000 in down payment and be willing to have and have the cash and make available the cash of a $71,000 annual payment versus I could rent that same land for $24,000. And if I'm looking at just needing to justify my equipment or upgrade my equipment based on my land base, the $24,000 might become um, a more viable option for me. So rent might become the way of the future. It might be a necessity due to cash flow issues. Um, purchasing land, I have the down payment and the annual payment to make versus on the rental, I just have that annual payment. So I don't know if that helped anyone decide whether renting or buying is better. Looking at today's markets with prices on land continuing to escalate and interest rates remaining where they're at, renting might be a viable option for, for the next, the short term um, for some producers. So very specifically, jumping into um, one of the commodities we grow here in Western Canada, canola. Everyone knows it by the, the beautiful small yellow flowers, which develop into pods. We typically take and make oil out of it. And once it's harvested, um, they're crushed and, and there's about 45% um, oil in, in the canola seeds. So the crop was actually really polished here in Canada in the last 50 years. It generates $29.9 billion in revenues each year. 43 million producers grow canola. 20 million acres produce 20 million tons of canola. But 90% of our canola is actually exported. And it's used for things like cooking oil, lubricant, biofuel, and animal feed. Biofuel has um, increased quite significantly in the last couple of years, as in what we're using canola for. 
So if we have a look at this is again, um, this is from the Manitoba government publishes some really good cost of production um, projections. If we have a look at this, we're not making huge margins on canola, this would be on a typical farm operation. We have a profit margin of about 5%. And if we talk break even price and break even yield, we're looking at a break even price of $14.97. And we're going to compare that to our projected um, what we think we're going to sell it for, which is the $15.75. Our break even yield of $42.78, we're going to compare it to the 45 bushels per acre that we're projecting we're going to grow. So that means my first 43 bushels that I'm growing are just going to cover my costs. So that means I only have two profit bushels per acre when it comes to my operation. So canola prices have been on a wild ride the last couple of years. So on average in 2019, we had about $10.50 canola, all the way up to in 2022, we had this $22.70 canola. I think it even went up to 23. So these are averages for the year. Um, producers were, were had, we've never seen prices like this before. And what happened is that our input costs followed these same trends and started going up at the same rate. And then what happened is that um, canola prices went up because we were exiting out of COVID. Um, it was the war in Ukraine was impacting things. It was, uh, there was high demand for our product. We were crushing a little bit more here in Canada. So what we've seen now, though, is this escalate, this de-escalation of prices, and we've seen it continue to move downwards. This is hard for farms to navigate because when the price of your commodity decreases, the cost of your inputs don't have a tendency to decrease at that same angle. They're not decreasing nearly as significantly, which means your cost of production is increasing. So if we have a look at this and we run some of those highs and lows as to what could potentially happen, uh, when we have a look at this, we can see that if I have 1575 canola, I'm at that 5% margin. If I get $22.50 canola, I'm gonna be at a 33% margin. But realistically, what we're seeing now in forecasting is that we might end up with 1325 canola. And if we do, I'm actually losing money on growing canola. I'm actually going to be not running a profit um, even before I factor in my interest expense. So helping farms navigate this is super challenging. So challenges producers are facing today, the increasing land values are making it challenging for producers to consider things like succession planning and to consider things like purchasing and expanding their operations. Um, increasing land values, increasing interest rates are also impacting that and fluctuating market prices and the impact of those input costs. All right. Hi, Darla. That was fantastic. We have some questions coming in right now. Uh, the first one is from an anonymous attendee, and they want to know, okay, they're saying, I believe that bringing together small municipalities to develop localized food systems with nearby farmers and finding solutions for land use and agriculture is essential. The current system is not effective, and we need to start from the grassroots level to create a more sustainable foundation. Can you respond to this, please, Darla? I do think that it's going to be up to the agricultural community to come up with solutions that make this uh, more meaningful and more impactful. It's about having a look at when we're seeing um, we're seeing land being sold now, um, and if you your goal is to sell it to to the highest bidder, you we have um, some auction sites here that we've seen land that would typically in our area sell somewhere in around maybe six hundred thousand dollars. And quarter sections of land were going for upwards of $900,000 because it's happening in a bidding situation. So I think it is about it is about communities choosing where their land is going. And if we look at sustainability and farming, it's fo focusing on that social aspect of um, continuing to do what's best for the world of agriculture. Yeah. 
And Mark, can I please ask you if you want to chime in here on that question uh, that was asked? So I will repeat it again. I believe that bringing together small municipalities to develop localized food systems with nearby farmers and finding solutions for land use and agriculture is essential. The current system is not effective and we need to start from the grassroots level to create a more sustainable foundation. How would you like to comment on this, Mark? Yeah, it's a big question. Um, it's a bold question, and it addresses a lot of the big themes, I think, that I, I think uh, small municipalities alone can be quite vulnerable if it's just municipal, if we think just too hyper local as well. I think it needs to be quite uh, complex, the, the, the factoring in of complexity and, and the ability to have municipalities uh, have strong, you know, farmers markets and local buying systems. Of course, I support that a hundred percent, but as well having the ability for, of course, um, uh, some areas that are better specialized in some forms of production, whether we're talking fruits and vegetables or, or red meat or grains or seafood, what have you, there has to be that, uh, um, that ability to to trade and 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 air especially and if an area suffers from a drought, so I think that 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 zonal flexibility needs to be in the equation. And I think I think the prairie provinces are are doing um a good job recently, and that's just what I'm more familiar with. And doing some more of our own processing. Ninety percent of our canola is exported. We're looking at um, the governments have been investing in getting more processing done here so that we aren't shipping our commodities off and then bringing them back to us in there. So the canola would actually be crushed here and processed here in Canada so that that improves um, job opportunities and actually helps some of these these smaller locations as well. I have a question for um, both speakers. Uh, first, I'll ask you, Darla, it's from Tatenda Mambo from the Simpson Centre. How much of the land prices reflect management practices on the farm that affect things such as soil health? Yeah, so if we have a look at, at land prices when we're looking at this, so if you're buying land, land is going to be uh, rated at different land values. Um, based on the type of soil that's there, right? So the, the better the soil, in, in theory, the higher the land values. Uh, and my experience has been is that it's location, location, location. People are willing to pay for land that is close to their other farm operations. When they're getting into being a very large operation, uh, vicinity really matters when it comes to that. I think farmers are stewards of the land and on are um, taking advantage. We talked a little bit about AI and tech. They're taking advantage of variable rate technologies, which helps them be more efficient. So we're not using um, pesticides or herbicides on all areas of a field. We're just using them where they're needed. And we are measuring the, the, the soil, um, the richness of the soil and actually only fertilizing where we need to fertilize and that farms are being um, significantly more focused on being responsible and accountable to that. Mark, do you want to comment on this as well? Yeah, soil health is, I think, one of the most important uh, issues of our times. It relates as, uh, to uh, the nutritional density, the nutritional value of the foods that we're eating, whether it's grains or, or, or fruits and vegetables, and also for the health of the animals if they're grazing and the, the vitality of the feed that's being produced. Um, a, a big issue or this topic of discussion today is a regenerative agriculture, and a lot of uh, food brands are actually building partnerships down downstream back to the farm and incenting farmers to uh, change their their um, soil management practices and incenting them for you know uh, the vitality and the nutritional density that can come from crops and, and products that are produced with uh, soil that is, is has vitality in it Okay, so I have a question from Peter Bukowski. Um, your message is that the next generation cannot afford to buy land, so they cease to be farmers or they become tenant farmers. The equivalent in the cities is that today's kids will never own their own home. Are we heading back to the serfdom of the of Europe in the 17 to 1800s? And Peter asks, if parents gift the farm to their children, what percentage will the government take in tax, thus requiring sell-off or part of the farm? I'm going to ask um, Mark to, to, to answer this one first, please. 
Well, thanks, Brandy. Fun, fun, <laughs> fun question. Do doomsday question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think Peter also asked that. Uh, Peter also asked the, the question uh, earlier about um, costs of food. Well, I mean, it's 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 big. I mean, I I I, I your your opinion is probably as you know you know have of course different perspectives to mine. I really I think that uh, you know land prices and housing prices, all of these things, you know, cost of living. These are all macro big questions. Um, I wouldn't know where to start in the time that we have. I mean, these are all these are all massive issues. Um, I yes, I think that we need robust policies that allow for equitable uh you know ca canadian society that we have accessibility for people and that people can afford and we have a diversity of people who are able to enter into the agricultural sector i think it's going to be a lot of creative policy work um it's going to be incentives that are required it's going to be hard decisions that need to be um made um and also of course add on that that to make it sustainable and to do it sustainably uh so no no uh, small order to that but <laughs> that's my first thought on that big question peter yeah that's a great question peter and i think that that is how some of my students feel when we talk this through in class i think that it's about being proactive and it's about um, like succession planning doesn't take place in a year. You don't decide, oh, I'm going to transfer the farm over in a year. You have to be really proactive about it and start talking about. And you can transfer the land um, from parent to child. There is some really great tax advantages on family farms that the government affords us. Uh, the first million dollars of capital gains on qualified par farmland is tax free. You don't actually have to pay any tax on it. Um, so it's about taking advantages of those opportunities and it's about being strategic and how people are taking over the farm. So I don't think we're going to return to to where we're just going to be tenant farmers. I think that families are going to have to be proactive in, in how they they do their succession planning. They need to work with work with the accountants and, and you're going to have some really unique arrangements that you can set up. But it is possible for the next generation to take over the family farms. I also think we need to engage more than just the people who are currently on the farm. We have a huge shortage in agricultural farm workers and in people in the world of agriculture. And agriculture, we need to expand the industry so that it's something that is considered the industry people want to work in. It doesn't matter. You don't have to have grown up on a farm in order to come and be a part of agriculture. If you are, if you eat and you enjoy food yes. and that's something you want to be a part of, it doesn't matter whether you're urban or rural or whether you've been on a farm or not on a farm. It is the most one of the most amazing industries in the world. And it's forever. I don't ever foresee a future where we don't need good quality food. And I think the industry needs to be really proactive in, in deciding what the, the their next steps are. And I think Mark made a great point in that it's going to take um, assistance and it's going to take, you know, some incentives. So um, sustainability on the farm, it will happen. But if a farm isn't economically profitable, they're not going to be able to be there um, to focus on sustainability in five years because they're going to run out of money. So we have to we have to balance. Yeah, it's that balance that we need to take into consideration. Well, and thank you so much. Can, oh, oh, go ahead, Mark. I was just about to wrap up. No, no, go ahead. Make your final comment, please. Yeah, maybe just 15 seconds. I think it's more more important than ever that farm farmers and farm families and farm communities need to think very creatively about their land. Uh, I think the the commodity focus, I, I personally think ha will have more and more challenges and mm -hmm. that to think creatively about the opportunity in your community for wherever that market is to, to produce uh, products in a way that is in demand uh, for sustainable, healthy food. That won't go out of style or won't go out of demand. Uh, and it's more important than ever. And the opportunities are there, you know, whether it's on farm or the examples I provided, like off, uh, uh, like the Alice example a moment ago. Well, I'm so happy that we are having this discussion. Uh, it's fascinating. And it's a discussion that has to be had uh, for the future of farming. So thank you, Mark and Darla, for sharing your knowledge with us today. And to our participants, you will receive a post-event survey and a registration link for the next online panel discussion, which will be on May 16th. And it's about food prices and farming. We'll be looking at fluctuating costs affecting the production of fruit and wheat. We'll also have 
have someone from Statistics Canada introduce the Food Price Data Hub as an interactive dashboard offering good information about food production and availability. Please also go to the SimpsonCenter.ca website and subscribe to hear more about upcoming events and receive our monthly newsletter for information based on research about Canadian food production. Thank you very much for joining us today.